<laughs> to the COVID 313 town hall. Um, we are so excited to be back with you today. Um, and we want to give folks time to get to the right place and get on the right line. And so um, if Cindy, you could please share the instructions for Spanish translation. Gracias por estar aquí hoy. Uh, si quiere escuchar esta presentación en español, por favor vaya a, al sitio Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation. Ahí va a haber traducción en vivo por uh, la señora Ofelia Martínez y Cristina Ruiz Mazón. Gracias. Thank you so much, Cindy. And, you know, we come here every Thursday, so I, I feel like we're all family and I I don't need to introduce myself, but I will do that. I'm Christine Bell. I'm the executive director of Urban Neighborhood Initiatives and a really proud mama of three really wonderful, amazing, energetic children. Um, and it is my honor every week to come here and learn with you and ask your questions and, um, and, and, and learn and learn good information and share really good information. So with that said, Katie is here starting us off with ESL. So could you please um, share the instructions for ASL translation? And I think I said ESL, but I made I meant ASL translation. Thank you so much, Katie. And it is great to have you back. We missed you last week. Um, so thank you for being with us today. And remember, we really want to hear from you. So um, you can put your comments or questions in the Facebook chat. And we've got Lindsay and Libby monitoring those chats, waiting to, to hear from you. Or you can text them to 313-288 2082. Again, that number is 313-288-2082. And on the Spanish line, we've got Brooke and Ophelia waiting for your questions and comments. So please keep them busy for the next hour and a half with your questions and comments. Um, and just to test out to make sure that our moderators are actually uh, tuning in, please let us know, how did you hear about the town hall today? And what are you most um, interested in? What's the topic that you're most um, looking forward to hearing about today? So how'd you hear about us? And what is what topic are you most looking forward to? And um, so while you're doing that, it is my pleasure uh, to be able to introduce, uh, well, I think I'm gonna introduce Terry and then Terry's gonna introduce uh, our, our official welcome. So my co-moderator today is my very, very good friend, Mr. Terry Whitfield, who is normally our timekeeper, but he's here today as our co-moderator, and I'm so excited to be doing this with him today. So Terry Whitfield, please introduce yourself, and then you can do the grand introduction for um, our, our official welcome. Christine, I've broken out from the timekeeping jail. I'm free. I'm on the screen. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Terry Whitfield. Um, I serve as a program officer at the Skillman Foundation. Um, um, I am a proud puppy dad uh, and husband to my wife, uh, Shay Whit. And we want to make sure we get everybody on the right line and so they can get comfortable. I'm probably repeating my buddy, Christine, but hey, we want to make sure everybody gets set. Um, but for that, Cindy, um, would you mind um, sharing the phone number for Spanish translation? Sí, claro. So, si necesita traducción, si necesita escuchar esta presentación en español, por favor, vaya al sitio Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation en Facebook. El enlace está dentro de los comentarios. Gracias. Awesome. And then, uh, Katie, if you wouldn't mind sharing it for ASL. Awesome. Um, so I hope you're, hope you're strapped into your seats and ready to go. 
um, excited to stay with us for the next uh, 60 minutes so you can stay informed and powerful. Uh, this is also a time for you to ask experts your questions and have a little fun. So to ask your questions, please use the chat on Facebook or text your questions to 313-288-2082. Again, that is 313-288-2082. We will have Q and A after each segment. If you can't, if we can't get an answer for your question today, we are committed to getting the answers to you by early next week. All the questions asked today will be posted with answers on OneDetroitPBS.org. For our experts, please remember to speak slowly for our translators. I had to remind myself uh, they want to make sure that they are translating the important information you are sharing correctly. Also, turn off your camera. Um, when you are not speaking to ensure our ASL interpreter can be seen as well as muting yourself when you're not speaking. Um, I am also serving as your timekeeper and I'll make sure to chat you your remaining time. And if you go over, either myself or Christine will lovingly jump on the screen uh, to help us move along. So uh, today we have a special town hall that I am excited um, to get us started with. Um, and really get us in the uh, frame of mind to be calm, uh, to be composed, uh, and in the midst of all that is going on, to be centered uh, into our best selves. So right now, I would really am excited to bring forth uh, Ms. Kimberly, uh, who is going to ground us in the wonderful practices um, of yoga. So Ms. Kimberly. Carrie, before Kim comes on, and, and mm -hmm. I am very much anticipating her, but we, Cindy has some words that she wants to share. Oh, see, her. I'm just jumping. <laughs> see, that's yeah. why, you know, that, that's what happens right when you, when you, when you don't do that. double dutch. Just you like end up that. smacking yourself in the head with a jump rope. <laughs> Go ahead, Cindy Gamboa. Well, bring well it guess on what? Forward. I'm back too, Terry. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So, that's right. That's what happens when they don't uh, let us back on, on the screen as often. Uh, hi, everyone. Cindy Gamboa back with you guys again. Uh, I'm really excited to open up this program today. I'm going to be brief because I know that we have a really good lineup of amazing people um, that are going to speak to us about mental health. As Terry said, you know, centering ourselves. Um, you know, we're, we're approaching the one year anniversary of when COVID hit our, our backyards, our communities real hard, right? We had uh, restrictions put in place, our social distancing restrictions we had to enforce, um, and our lives really changed drastically. And I've been reflecting on this a lot, you know, over the last couple of weeks, and, and um, it's really been amazing, even though it, the road has been really bumpy at times, and we've had a lot of transformation. It's really amazing where we are and how we've been able to transform systems that we thought we were never going to be changed. Um, there's been a lot of people that stepped up to the plate to make sure that our communities are are being, um, you know, being making sure that everyone is taken care of and we're excited to see this transformation and continue to work with you guys on this. Um, today, I'm excited about the show because as I said, it's, it's around mental health. And as a parent myself with two, three children, I've seen how difficult it is to continue to raise my children. My uh, teenager, my middle schooler is just yearning for the day where he can go back into class to be around his friends. Uh, my, my high school senior is just you know, anxious to resume his life and, and not miss out on his senior activities that he was looking forward to pretty much all his senior uh, career. And my preschooler, man, not to mention, she is just so um, energetic and she's just yearning for the day that she can just climb on a, on a playground again with her, with her, with her friends. So um, our kids, are definitely struggling. I know we have our struggles of our own, but we also uh, think about the struggles of our children and how it is that we're, we're being able to aid them in this time of need. So we're gonna go ahead and kick off our segment with uh, Kimberly that can kind of uh, re have us uh, center ourselves, make sure that we're ready to hear the, the things that we're gonna hear around mental health resources. 
Caleb's kids is on today and they will, they're going to talk about mental health supports for reducing anxiety and stress that our, our kids often face. And we're going to go ahead and hear a lot about, you know, what else is available, what other resources, funding is available for our communities that's getting to our communities or not getting to our communities, right? So that is in store for today. And uh, I'm really excited. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Christine. Christine, are you? Look at that. Uh, there you go. Hi, guys. Both Carrie and I are here. This, I feel like we're doing like a little bit of double dutch. Um, jumping in. <laughs> I, I can't do double dutch. But I wish, I always wish that I could. I was a good jump roper, but. Um, not double dutch. Cindy, it's been, <laughs> it's been fantastic to hear your words um, and have you back with us today. And it just resonates so much with me. My son came home on Monday and said to me, mom, am I allowed to use the bathroom at school? And I, it didn't even occur to me that we should have ever talked about um, whether he, because of the virus, if he could use the bathroom at school and his first week back face to face. So it just reminded me that, that we all are experiencing this, even kids. So thank you so much for that reminder. And I'm really excited for our guests that are, are going to, um, help us as parents to, um, to really, uh, work with our kids and ourselves on, on how we, how we return. Um, so so up next is Miss Kimberly Boyd. She is um, our amazing yoga instructor. Um, so I'm I'm just gonna let her take it over here and and center us in in what we are gonna be looking forward to today. So, Kim. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christine. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Community is my honor to be here with you today. I love our theme to remember to be calm, to be centered, to relax, perhaps to energize. But the question is, where are you now and what do you need? So I'm going to begin us where yoga begins, which is the breath, then transition us to where most people know that yoga can take us, which is to really engage and listen to our bodies. And then the third place that yoga supports is in being aware of the thoughts that we hold in our minds. And when those three powerful elements come together, our breath, our movements, and our thoughts, we can do anything. So right now, right where you are, I invite you to get centered, which is an idea that we hear a lot. So the question is, what does that really mean? Well, it means that wherever you are, whether you're sitting down or whether you're standing up, that you take a moment and simply pause and really feel the connection of your feet to the earth. So let's practice right where you are right now. Okay? Just move around in your seat if you're seated and then bring yourself to a centered place where you can truly feel the soles of your feet connected to the earth. And from this place, just take a nice easy breath in through your nose, maybe bring your shoulders up and gently blow it out of your lips and repeat. Once again, breathing in through your nose, breathing out through your lips. A third time, just to complete the cycle, in through your nose, out through your lips. And now return to your own natural breath, the breath that you breathe because your body knows how and tune inward for a moment and notice how are you feeling today, right? Or how's your energy? If we were gonna use a scale of one to five, one being, I don't have a lot of energy today two meaning I have a little bit more, three all the way up to five, I'm feeling really energized. Just take a moment to ask yourself, check in with yourself, where are you today? Are you feeling a little less energized? I think I'm a one or two or three or four or five. 
and then keep that in mind so that as I offer the next ideas, you can choose what's best for you. Because there's some things we're going to do if you're feeling a little low energy, that's what you want to do. If you're feeling like you need to calm things down, then there are other things that you can do. Right, so starting from here, when we are seated with our backs up nice and long, we're doing something called mountain pose. And if you think of mountains, they are strong, they are secure, they are stable. So let's use that as our image for our mountain pose. And in a moment, chicka chicka boom boom, I'm gonna give myself some more room. What I'm gonna do is stand in place right where I am. So you can stand with me if you're ready. I'm gonna move myself back so that you can see a little bit more of me. Notice that I'm keeping the chair nearby in case I need some support. So we have the seated mountain pose. Let's do a standing mountain pose. The soles of your feet connected to the earth, really feeling strong and stable and supported like a mountain, all right? So we have our breath meditation in three nose, shoulders up, exhale through the lips. We have our body movement, mountain pose, sitting strong with our backs long, standing with our feet connected to the earth, heads nice and tall. Now let's think about the words that we think with our mind. Let's borrow our inspiration for the mountain and right where you are, just say to yourself, I am strong. I am stable. I am secure. Or any other positive ideas you might want to hold for yourself. From here, let's just open your arms wide to the side, reaching up to the sky, looking up, breathe in. And as you exhale, press your arms down and release the breath and repeat. So you don't have to move at the same time that I'm moving. Really listen to where you are breathing in and to where you are breathing out and bring the movement together with your breath. And one more time, breathing in and breathing out. And once again, checking in with yourself, maybe being one hand to your heart. How's your energy? Low energy, a little more energy. Five, feeling really energized, right? Was there a change? From here, sometimes if you are still feeling kind of low energy, you may want to just literally shake it off. So right where you are, take a nice easy breath in, take your arms and just shake, 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 right? And try that again. Just shake, 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 shake. Right? And now try it with the leg. I'm gonna hold on to my chair. Shake, 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 shake. What we do on one side, we do on the other. Shake, 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 right? If you're feeling really robust, you might wanna shake your whole entire body. Ready? And shake, 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 shake. Notice that my voice started to change. So ha, there's something ha, really wonderful ha, about just shaking, shaking. Ha, and letting the breath go and you cannot get it wrong. And then gently bring yourself back to the mountain, right? Because sometimes things shake us up, but we know where we can return to the base of this mountain where we can remember as inspired by the mountain, we are strong, we are stable, we are secure. Right? And now check in with your energy again, right? Was there a change? Still feeling low energy? Did you give yourself a little more energy? Well, if you're feeling really super energized and you wanna bring it down, take a nice easy breath in and instead of shaking, let's do a brush, gentle brush. Down one arm and then the other, gently brushing all the way down. And notice that I'm using my breath together with the end of the movement so that whatever it is that we need to just release and let go can be returned in a downward motion to the earth and now standing firm and strong once again, checking in with yourself. How are you doing? Is your energy available at one or two or three or four or five? Is it where you want it to be? The most important thing as we open your arms wide, breathing in, and exhaling is to notice where you are and take yourself to where you want to be. So now my invitation to you is to consider 
What's the inspiration you want to hold for yourself, in your mind, in your body, and your breath? I've offered a few thoughts, being strong, or stable, safe, wise, whatever it is that you would hold for yourself right now, I invite you to simply inhale, open your arms wide to the side, and as you're breathing in, take in that thought, I am. And as you exhale, release anything that would prevent you from getting this next breath. And once again, say, I am. Fill in the blank. Make it something really good, powerful, beautiful, inspiring, strong. One more. I am. And as you exhale this time, once again, one hand to your heart, the other hand checking in. Where's your energy? Is it where you want it to be? And if it's not, or if there's anything you just did that made your body go, ooh, I like that. Oh, let's try that again. Please do. My name is Kimberly. And it is always an honor to lead your practice. So community, remember, you are strong and together we are strong. You are wise and together we are wise. You are well and together. We as a community are well. Peace. That is awesome. Thank you, Ms. Kimberly. Uh, it is amazing. Every time you come on, like I'm, I'm always a hyper individual, but when you get on, I'm calm, I'm centered. I feel much better about the day and about the practice we got going on today. So thanks, Ms. Kimberly, appreciate you. Um, so now, it is uh, my honor and my distinct privilege uh, to bring on our next guest. Um, she is somebody that is always down for some good trouble um, and is really the voice of, of parents and families, um, not just in Detroit, but really across the state. Uh, so really just want to bring in Ms. Arlisa Hurd uh, to give us a bit of information. There's a lot of things happening in Lansing right now, federal government, dropping, you know, signing the new COVID relief bill. There are significant impacts in terms of dollars that are coming into our um, into our state and in particular into Detroit. And wanted to bring her on to give us some insight in terms of what we should be looking for and how those dollars will be interacting and what is the voice of community and how we can be more uh, proactive in this conversation. So, Ms. Arlisa, where are you at? right here, Terry. <laughs> boom, boom. That's what I'm talking about. How you hey, doing listen, today? I'm good. You know what? Listen, I am so glad that Kimberly Boy came on first because some of this stuff happening in Lansing is stressing a whole, whole lot of folks out and I needed that shaking off. I really needed that. So um, I'm just, I'm not going to be here before you long, but just to recap for those of you last week, we talked a little bit about what's happening with all of the funds. You know, um, the state of Michigan, not only the state of Michigan, but pretty much every state in the country, uh, the federal government released funds to those states to help with all efforts as it related to the pandemic. And in this case, especially our schools definitely need the help. You name it, it's happening. Uh, from uh, PPE equipment to better filtration systems since uh, kids are now going back to school uh, to all kinds of supplemental programs that may help because of learning loss, summer school, tutoring, you name it, it is what our school needs. However, there's been somewhat of an issue. Now, uh, when federal funds are passed down to the states uh, in a case like this, the Appropriations Committee in our legislature is really supposed to be like a pass-through. They take the money and pass it along to where it's supposed to go. Those federal dollars are already designated to come here and it's a certain amount and we know where they should go. However, in our state, because of the political climate and the infighting, some of our legislature decided to tie up those funds and tie them to other pieces of legislation, which makes it difficult to appropriate the money. Uh, long story short, unless the governor signs off on what the legislature or some of the folks in the legislature wants, then those that monies cannot be appropriated. 
So the governor either has to veto the entire thing or accept the entire thing or veto parts of it. Well, it's been a lot of going back and forth. And so what we have as of Tuesday, as of yesterday, I believe, Tuesday, the governor, uh, which he has the power to do this, she chose to take line by line and veto some of the parts that she could veto. Uh, the legislature can override it, but they have to have a two thirds majority. They were not successful, so uh, that's good in one in one sense. But on the in the other sense, it is not good because one of the bills required her to pretty much leave the opening and closing of schools and opening and closing of school sporting events. They wanted her to push that power onto the local health departments, the local county health departments. She vetoed that, and as a result of that. There's more than $841 million that's pretty much left unappropriate, not unappropriated. Um, and there, it may even be a little bit more than that, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, if this sounds confusing, that's because it is. There uh, continues to be more inward fighting. Um, there continues to be a going back and forth. My understanding is that the, G, uh, the um, legislature has now attempted again to try to see if they can pass through some of those bills that she vetoed and the list goes on and on. So where we are now, there are some dollars for some COVID relief that is being appropriated. However, um, not all of those dollars. I just want to appeal to the parents, even if you don't even understand this, I just wanna appeal to the parents this, to, to let you know, this is, not, this is not about the city of Detroit here. This is not about Pontiac or Flint. This is about the entire state of Michigan. I wanna, it doesn't matter what political side you're on, just ask yourself this sobering question. Do you think the superintendents in your school district would very much be okay with withholding much needed dollars for those schools in those areas, just so that the legislature can just kind of duke this thing out? I don't think so. Nobody wants to be in the middle of this. Now, listen, if they want to, I always say, you know, if they want to fight about it, why don't they just have a softball game on the front lawn of the Capitol or something? I don't know. Do whatever you want to do to, to, to resolve your differences. But I've always said, just don't bring the students, teachers, and families in the middle of this fight. These are much needed dollars. And, and, and it wasn't just school dollars that was tied up in this thing. There's rental assistance that's tied up in this thing. There's property tax relief that's tied up in it. All of this stuff is part of the COVID relief packaging that the federal government has designated for all of the states to have a part in. So I wanna just say to you as this saga continues and as we, we trickle on down, uh, we're in a situation where if we don't use it, we lose it. Uh, I just ask that it, all of those parents that are on the Western side of the state, those, and, and no matter where you live, reach out to your legislature and ask them, are they behind some of this and tell them to cut it out. Cut it out. Cut uh, it out, Terry. <laughs> we need Kimberly Arlene. Boyd to maybe we need to have Kimberly Boyd go up to the Capitol and just do a mass yoga. Maybe that's what it is. Everybody's all stressed out. What about that? Would that work? <laughs> it, it might, especially if you're driving the bus, Arlisa. Ah. Um, I, I I do have a question for you. Um, yeah. it, what is it that parent? It it seems. The challenge is not with Detroit legislators um, in particular, that we're really thinking about those areas that are um, within more Republican leaning spaces. What is it that you feel we can do here? And you mentioned a little bit, like how do we reach out to friends we might have that are on the west side of the state? Um, yes. Can you speak to things that we can do here or other efforts that you know of that are helping to engage you know, the other side of the aisle? Absolutely. So uh, the two, the two in particular who were pretty much spearheading some of this 
uh, is the, we have the House Appropriations Chairperson. His name is Thomas Albert. And then the Senate Appropriations uh, Chairperson is Jim Stamos. Now, if you reside in either of those districts, you definitely need to be reaching out and asking them and telling them to cut this out. What I've noticed is politicians seem to fear the most is not being reelected. And so this is a situation, this is not, you know, we, we have to be careful, I think, as constituents. You may favor a particular party over another, but I think we have to be reasonable and not allow ourselves to get caught up in the politics of it, especially when our livelihoods are on the line. This doesn't matter what side you're on. This means that your kids may not get exactly what they need in their schools, or you might not either just because there's a power struggle. So uh, emailing those legislators. Now, I know we put that information up last week. We may be able to get to run it again this week. But emailing those legislators, please don't stop. Call their phones. Talk to some of your other friends who live in the same districts and tell them this is about everybody. And if you don't believe me, research the issues. Just go and look at it and you'll see all of this going back and forth is just absolutely ridiculous. But we need constituents, the constituents to tell these legislators, we're not going to take this. And if you keep this up, you won't have a job. Well, we do have some questions from the audience. Excuse me. Um, one question is, um, is there a deadline on when these dollars have to be spent before we actually lose the dollars? Yes, the dollars need to be spent by the next fiscal year. Now, what I'm not clear on is when that is. I've heard that, uh, I think it's it's either 14 months, it's either the next 14 or the next 18 months. But the, the problem, some of that, somebody may say, oh, well, that's enough time to du duke this out. The issue with that, and someone, I think it was Christine that brought this point up and I've been running with it ever since. The problem with that is, if you wait down to the last minute to give somebody a bunch of money, the money doesn't get spent effectively because what you needed it for was six months ago. And if you if you know anything about federal dollars, you gotta spend all of it. Nobody wants to send federal dollars back. So if you have a chance at getting, I don't know, 200 or, or let's say $800,000 now to spread it out over the next 14 months, it makes more sense to get it down and use it efficiently rather than wait until next June sometime and have to spend it in two months. It doesn't make sense. So yeah, it's 14 or 14 to 18 months, but I believe it's 14 months. Awesome. And then um, you, you, you touched on it, you know, throughout the, your, 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 your update for us, but what would these dollars be spent on? So the dollars that are particularly specifically being held, uh, what are they um, designed to be spent on, uh, you know, uh, in terms of coming from the feds to the state? Do they have a particular function in which they're meant to be spent on? And that, well, this is the beauty of it, because um, the dollars, well, of course, you know, nobody can go and buy themselves a house or something like that. But this is where school districts and superintendents have um, their, their choice of things. Where, For instance, you you couldn't take federal dollars and just repair your buildings or make some uh, changes to your buildings. This this money is to do what you need to do if you feel COVID has impacted uh, to make you know your building to make it safer for kids to come back. We hear a lot of schools talking about the filtration systems. We hear schools talking about they're going to use better. Um, um, personal protective equipment. Uh, we hear schools talking about they're getting uh, set up for supplemental programs or tutors. Uh, we also, you know, any number of things, whatever has been impacted in the schoolhouse with COVID, it is up to the discretion of the school boards and the school district and the superintendents to figure out where that money goes. This is not a thing where somebody's gonna abuse it and taking free trips to, to, to I don't know, Maui or something like that, because sometimes that's the narrative you'll hear people say, it's not that. They're gonna use it for exactly what their school district needs right where they are, whether that's for better uh, tech equipment, 
or what have you, but our schools need it because we really suffered this year with COVID. Wow. Uh, well, you know what? As always, Arlisa, uh, you bring the fire and you speak uh, truth, uh, not only to power, but to the people that we, we know are following you and the lead of 42 Forward and other organizations that help make sure our kids are getting the resources um, that they need uh, to be able to move beyond this time that we're in. So, um, Christine, do you, you got, uh, you, you got a question or you got something for Ms. Arlisa? You well, just I just, I wanted to, yep. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone that, um, wherever you fall on this, just make sure that you're actively having your voice heard. Um, remembering that, uh, we, our legislature was, is there representing us. And so they can't know what we want unless we tell them what we want. So whether you agree or disagree, that you should let that, that agreement or disagreement be known. And Arlisa, thank you for, could you just really quickly summarize what, like what are the things that um, are like the three things that are incredibly important as parents that we walk away with knowing. Um, so maybe like, how can this money help that kind of thing? What do we need to know so that when we make that phone call about, you know, how we feel, we know what to say. Well, one thing we definitely want to let these legislators know is cut this out release these funds, let these funds be appropriated. Stop playing games with the money. Don't tie the funding to something else because that's been the issue. They tied the appropriation of the funds to based on whether or not the governor can release uh, some of her pandemic powers and all of that. You know, that gets us over into the weeds. We don't want it. We don't need to be taking sides. We should be on the sides of the schools and the children. There's also something else that seems to be bubbling up too, by the way, and I just want to put this out there. There seems to be, uh, folks are looking at whether or not there is some sort of a legal issue about tying or tie barring federal funds that are designated for school aid funds, whether or not you can tie that to another piece of legislation and not appropriate them. So that seems to be something else that's coming up on the horizon. But for parents, I would say, never stop letting your voice be heard. You call these legislators, whether you're in their district or not, you can still call them. Call them and let them know, cut this out, that the people of Michigan are not going to stand for this. Our children need the money in the classrooms. They need the supports now. They don't need to wait 14 months. And quit playing this game of chicken because that's what it is. It's almost like it's a standoff. They're going to see who blinks first. All this going back and forth. And then there's money that's still out there that's still not assigned. Who wants to deal with that? Call these legislators now, flood their phone lines, flood their emails, and you let you get you some people together in your district and you let these legislators know that they're not going to be elected. They fear not being reelected. And this is not a game. This is not about one side or the other. This is about our kids and COVID relief for our families. And we have to be vocal about that. So shake them up. Don't be afraid to shake up some tables. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Arlisa. It is so uh, it's so great to have you um, every day or every week at the town hall. So, Terry, I'm gonna kick it back to you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Arlisa. Arlisa. Uh, appreciate you. So now, um, again, we our COVID three one three community coalition prides ourselves on being able to um, bring the most important information uh, to our to our viewership. So. Right now, with the reopening of schools, it is most important that we get information from our schools around how is the rollout moving? How are things um, happening? What opportunities are they seeing where the community can step in and be supportive? Um, so now we're just excited to have um, three individuals the representing um, various districts across our city. Uh, we have Jennifer Lawrence uh, with National Heritage Academy. She's a special education supervisor in Detroit. And we also have Erin Willis. She's a principal at Detroit Leadership Academy. And we have um, representation from DPSCD. I know we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, and I know Crystal is um, not feeling the best. So 
Uh, we expect to have um, Irenetta, uh, Irenetta Wright, Deputy Superintendent of Schools from DPSED joining us soon. So as soon as she jumps in, we'll go on ahead and uh, bring her into the conversation. But right now I'm gonna kick it over to Christine because she's the one uh, with the questions. Thank you, Terry. All right. So um, Jennifer, why don't we start with you and then Aaron, we'll come back to you because Aaron, you're gonna speak really specifically, I think to um, some of some of what what schools are thinking as as we are uh, as the vaccine is is readily available and schools are thinking about what happens next and I know that Jennifer represents a uh, um, you know a, a group of folks that have been working with a target population our special ed target population and we really want to talk with you around mental health and what's happening with schools around mental health. Um, so, so uh, Jennifer, could you talk a little bit about what National Heritage is doing in this moment to support um, to support families and students around their mental health? And what are you looking um, to do? At, you know, as our Lisa said, as 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 this this ether money comes down, the hope is that some of it will be used for mental health. And, and what are you all looking forward to using it for um, in, in both the mental health space, but maybe also the special education space. Absolutely. So let's get started with those two questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much for having me. Um, this is a topic I'm super passionate about. So um, all the energy from the morning is just really great and kicking it off with yoga was amazing. Um, you know, we saw pretty early on that we needed to step up what we were doing related to um, mental health, which I also call social emotional health. And so what we started, um, the team that I'm leading started to create is really check in regular social emotional check ins with us and the staff so that staff can begin to do that with the students. And, and really all it is, you know, Kimberly said it really well this morning, where are you at right now? That's really what we want parents and teachers and students to be asking one another, how are you right now? Where are you at right now? And developing any sort of regular way for students to start to express what they're feeling is really the first step in mental health. As someone, I grew up in a family where we didn't have those conversations, those things weren't happening. So I had to learn those skills as an adult and they're not easy. And so what we've really done is taken, there's a something called CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. And so what we did was there are five competencies around social emotional learning. And so they are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, which is how we interact with one another, and then relationship skills and responsible decision-making. So what we started doing, and those aren't really tough, they may sound complex, but they're not. We started with self-awareness and this idea of building safety. And so what we did was we actually started monthly town halls um, with the target audience being all of our school leaders and all of our school staff, but every activity that we created really was something that could be turned around and done with students. And as a mom, I know, Christine, you mentioned it this morning, and, and Cindy, I think as well, we also Hi. hear and get feedback and input from our hey, are you? what, what, what they're thinking. Can I join the meeting now? No, I just didn't get confirmation back that the updates were fine, and so I just wanted to make sure that you got the time. So. And oh, what, yeah. 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 Hi, Renata. No worries. We're okay, so no problem. All right, thank you. Thanks. Right. Bye. 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 Hi, Renetta, we're so glad you're here. Can you mute yourself for just a minute? Thank um, you, go ahead, Jennifer. Yes, no worries. So we really um, created this curriculum almost that takes everybody through, first of all, like establishing safety. Safety doesn't mean the same thing for everybody and emotional safety is different from physical safety. So we really set up these forums where um, we checked in regularly with the staff and the teachers and the providers to see how they're doing, but we also encourage them to go ahead and turn around and, and ask it 
to the students and have the students build the skills to recognize where am I at right now and where do I want to be? So to answer your question about what we would maybe hope to do with some potential funding, there's lots of different tools out there that you can use even with your kids at home. I printed this one off. This is from something called Therapy Aid. Um, it's free online and it's really just a feelings chart. And so you can use the, a feelings chart like this that you print off for free online. You could use emojis, even like printing off emojis my kids and I have used. And we're really just checking in with one another and, and checking in with other people shows that you care about how they are, which is what builds safety in relationships. And so we started there and then built throughout the year and it's gotten such great feedback and input um, from the organization that we're looking to build that out for families then next year where we could even start to do some town hall families with parents and give some tips and tricks on how to do that. And right now it really is all just about extending grace and accepting everybody where they're at and, um, and just checking in, you know, like Kimberly said it best, where are you at right now? And stopping to take a moment, because if we don't stop, life isn't going to let make a life won't stop. We can only do that for ourselves. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And then is there, um, in terms of your special ed population, is there, is there any, any sort of um, bits of advice that you can give to our parents as we're still in this, you know, a year later, we're still, we're still here, you know, here in the literal sense that we made it. And then also in the, in the, we're not back to, to what um, we all view as normal and, and normal is going to look different after, after this is over. So, um, but what advice would you give parents right now, particularly our parents who um, have have a special education students? Sure. I think, I mean, first off, just asking your kids and asking yourself and being open with how you're feeling and that it's okay to not feel great right now. Just the other night, my husband and I were having a talk about you know, we, it does feel like we might be on an upswing, but it also feels like this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And, and that brings with it some other emotions and feelings too. So I think I would say, be patient with yourself and how you're feeling. Um, be patient with your kids because they're likely maybe going to act out or even behave in ways that you aren't used to. And that's all okay. I think just shying away, don't shy away from the conversation at home and, and tools like these feelings charts, or I showed, these are a couple of books that I just use at home, the spot of books, there's a sp little spot of anger, a little spot of anxiety, and it really teaches kids some coping tools and adults, my, my kids and I, we read it together. And so I think having the conversation at home, but then also don't be afraid to use your voice to ask the questions of the school. Right. So um, and having those questions answered, the school may not have answers right now either. Right. But just being able to voice your concern and ask the questions and and maybe get the help you need, maybe asking if there's any level of summer support would be something I would think about if I had a child in that in that boat right now. Is there anything that could be done over the summer? Because we all have experienced special ed or not a lot of um, we've just experienced a lot of regression. Um, I know my kids in general and have absolutely struggled through this as well. So everybody's going to be um, struggling with this in their own way. But I think just not shying away from the conversations and being okay that you won't have the answers. It's okay to say, I don't know. Sometimes that's better than shying away from the conversation. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And now I'd like to bring Erin and Irenetta um on so that from administrators perspective um i'd like to hi erin and ironetta i think is coming off um but so i'm i just from the administrators perspective if you could just reflect on um on on you know what your thoughts are on what the new normal might look like and um, based on you know what you learned over over the last year, what are your thoughts about what the new normal in schools might look like? 
Would you like me to start or I, Renetta? I, um, you're off mute, so why don't you go ahead and start, and then I will, I will kick it to I, Renetta. Okay, sounds good. So I, you know, and um, Miss Wright and I have different positions within our districts. I am actually a principal at Detroit Leadership Academy, as uh, Terry shared earlier. And so my view is specific to our school and our K-8 establishment. And so I think um, <laughs> it's interesting when you ask about the new normal, because we just had students return to our building on March 1st, and that was on an optional basis. So we have approximately 430 students enrolled and approximately 120s parents opted for them to return to this school. And so actually right before this meeting, I was um, collaborating with the director from our network talking about what are we learning as we're having students in school right now and what will that mean for next year? How does it look? And this is what I know for sure. One thing I know for sure is that in kindergarten, first grade and second grade, I think they need to be in front of a teacher because it is difficult for them to navigate things on the computer. And so some of the very basic early literacy skills that um, students get when they first start school, I think are less transferable computer-wise than in person. If this is just, and I'm giving you my opinion, there may be some who disagree, but I myself have been in the kindergarten room for the last two weeks since we've started this. And so I've been able to see both what works well with the kindergartners as well as where they need additional support. And so I'm very concerned that we need to get our youngest people back as quickly as possible to full-time in-person instruction. I think the other thing that we've learned is that um, education doesn't have to look how it always looked. There is a lot of room for flexibility. Um, you know, it's interesting to me that for years, many schools talked about producing students with 21st century skills. Well, one of the ways that you can produce students with 21st century skills is making sure that they all have a computer to work on. And many of our schools in Detroit did not have that simply because of funding. But I'll be darned, like pretty much overnight, <laughs> we were able to make that happen and get one-on-one -on -one devices in the hands of our kids, uh, find hotspots and, and work with donors and lots of different collaborators to get internets into the homes of our kids and families. And so I think um, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. And I think the opportunity that COVID has provided to us is that we really can think outside of the box of education. And I don't think that we should chuck all the things that we've done to go back to what it was. I think we need to find the merge and really think critically about what worked well because some kids really were very successful learning online and what needs to be improved and how quickly, and also I'd say, how do we minimize the fears of staff and students about returning into the building? So those are the things that are top of mind when you ask about the new normal um, for me. Hi, Renata, go ahead. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think I would agree quite a bit with Erin uh, in terms of thinking about staffing, um, looking at comfort, not only of staff, but comfort of parents, comfort of students uh, transitioning back into the building. As we are preparing for next school year, um, we are really considering, and some of that's going to come down to lawmakers and what they count, so to speak, as full-time instruction or the full-time equivalency of instruction. So we don't want to be you know, presumptuous as we're talking about what we're looking to do next. But as we're thinking through it, we believe from surveying our families and from conversation with our stakeholders that there will still be a population of parents that will want their children to be at home in some kind of a virtual platform. And so as we're thinking about it, 
Um, we believe that we will see some of that next year. We are hopeful that we will have more of our teachers back in the building because we do agree um, that teachers, we really do want our teachers in front of our students. You know, when you think about it, uh, we opened in September and we our parents had the option uh, for online or face-to-face. -face. And then we discontinued or suspended face-to-face -face learning in November. And then we've just reopened on uh, the 26th, we went back to learning centers. And then on March the 8th, we opened for face-to-face. -face. And there are some of our students that have not been in school in a school building since last March. So when we just think about that alone, there is a lot that needs to be done in a lot of different spaces around that. I do think that we're also, uh, that COVID has also helped us or the pandemic has also helped us to think about all of these things differently. You know, how we're thinking about educating our students and, and what does in, does quality instruction look like and, and instruction face-to-face -face versus instruction online. And, and how are we ensuring that we are addressing the needs of all because to Aaron's point, there are some students that have been successful in the virtual space. The reality for our district is that's not been most of our students. And so we are really looking at how we accommodate um, those students that really find that virtual space as the right place for them, but making sure, while at the same time, making sure that students that really need to be in front of a teacher and they need those interventions and they re need remediation or they need enrichment and, or they need the, the social um, interactions that they have with others, that there's also the space for them to have those things. That's great. And so both of you um, mentioned um, mentioned staffing. And so a question that we're hearing a lot from parents is, and I, Renata, you spoke to this being, you know, you know, you have 50,000 students that you are planning for, and you talked on a different town hall about this. But if we, you know, as you guys are thinking about returning to face-to-face -to -face learning, how will you ensure that we, that the structures are in place to do that safely, including teachers, building support staff. And, and you both know that oftentimes, you know, our kids are sitting in classrooms of 40 um, and, or, you know, even 20. And, and so, and, and some of that has to do with teaching and people moving around and enrollment. So, so what, what's happening now to really think through those structures to make sure that 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 everyone, you know, administrators, staff, mm -hmm. students, parents are all feeling, yes, this is safe. Yes, we can do this. So, Ironetta, you're off mute. If you could go first and then Aaron will shift to you. Sure. So we follow very closely the recommendations and guidelines of CDC. Um, and one of the things that we started with, and we were just in a conversation on this this morning um, with our superintendent and our principals, is, you know, there are some recommendations around the difference in the three feet versus the six feet. You know, we're a school district that's still honoring six feet because we do not believe at this point that our parents or our teachers would be comfortable um, with anything otherwise. You know, there is a lot of education that's still happening for everyone, you know, education for families, education for teachers, understanding, um, you know, the changes in the in the guidelines and the recommendations. So where we started, we believe unless something changes in terms of, again, how are we funded for full time and what does it look like for full time? We do believe that we would still maintain the safety precautions that we started this year. So in individuals coming in the building, you know, they would have to have um, they would have to have their temperature taken. They would have to have, have a mask that we would still have sanitizing stations that we will still do wipes that we would still expect movement to be at least at least six feet for all of our classrooms. We did the same thing. So where uh, you may have a class pre COVID that may accommodate 30 students, that same class right now in post-COVID um, or going through COVID, I should say, it may only be 15. In some instances, it may be 12. And so that's something that we've honored. As we think about additional funding and much of the funding that's coming to districts is one-time funding. So when we think about the increase of salaries and those kinds of things, it's not recurring money. So it's not something that we could say year after year, we can increase salaries, but it does allow us to do some additional things like um, hiring additional staff so that we continue to uh, make classroom sizes smaller, uh, give individuals smaller populations to work with. Look at certain things like 
different groups if possible. So you may have an A day group and a B day group. Um, if again, the asynchronous learning is something that is allowed as, it, as we think about the lawmakers. So I think in terms of our safety precautions, we're moving forward with the expectation that we would maintain at least the safety precautions that we have right now. Great, thank you, Ironetta. Um, Aaron, go ahead. I absolutely agree with everything Ironetta said. I think that it can't be emphasized enough. And, and it's interesting how you guys have planned this town hall today because Ms. Heard that it was first about the fact of the monies being tied up. And, and so I think what Ironetta said is spot on. A lot of the schools make are based around the guidance that comes down from legislation, which hasn't come yet. But I totally agree that we fully intend to continue to honor the guidelines that the CDC has laid forth. Um, and in addition to that, I would add a couple of things. We have encouraged all staff to be vaccinated. Um, I would say that I think Detroit has done an amazing job because educators in Detroit were some of the first educators that I know of who were eligible to receive the vaccine. And so, you know, we have to that end, we've continued to have, we have staff calls once a month and we bring in people from the health field who can talk about, you know, what are the risks associated with the vaccine? What is the benefit with the vaccine? And the vaccine is our families that are eligible to get it. So we're really, you know, pushing people to um, move towards the vaccine so that we can establish the herd immunity. Um, class sizes, I totally agree. <laughs> I, I've actually been chuckling about the class size thing for a while because uh, what social distancing did for class sizes is something that all educators have always known is best for kids. Reduce class sizes. <laughs> and so to the extent that we're able to continue to do that, we will absolutely do that. And then I think the last piece that I would add is that um, kind of connecting to what Jennifer said at National Heritage, we are also uh, emphasizing mental health focus for both our students and our staff. And so to that end, we have resilience PLCs that our staff can attend each month. We have um, a support through the insurance that they can go for counseling and things like that, because we know that the pandemic has created a lot of emotional upheaval for a lot of people based on many factors, loss of job, loss of loved ones, et cetera. And with our students, we have programs in our school, like a mindfulness program, uh, therapy to kind of tackle that. So I think it's the safety is physical safety, but it's also mental health safety. And so we're looking at it from both of those facets. And can I say one other thing? Yeah, yeah. The other thing that I that I just wanted to lift up is that we've talked a lot about in this conversation, the fact of the pandemic creating a crisis, but I also think it, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the racial and political divides that have occurred in this country that have also contributed to the mental health crisis, mm -hmm. specifically with the populations that we serve. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we are working on doing is educating ourselves and our staff about the practices that we use to ensure that we are not contributing to systemic oppression and also then um, examining what we're doing to make sure that it is in the best interest of our students and families. And so I think that that also contributes to safety when we talk about mental health. Thank you for for that, and and I, I appreciate you answered my other question in your answers around the the ESSER money because I think we also need to talk more about the dollars that are right now at the state and how you all are waiting for them so that you can you can plan. And so thank you for talking about that. I think the more I, speaking from a parent perspective, the more I know as a parent about what the school is, is needing them for the more motivated I am to, to um, I mean, I'm pretty motivated, but um, the more motivated, I, the more knowledge I have when to go back and say, this is why this is important. You know, we're not 
you know, there, there are real tangible things that you all are going to use these dollars for and, and, and is at that they're integral to making sure that we have the, the support that we need. And I also just really appreciate both of you uplifting what the pandemic has done. I mean, it has been really difficult and we all know that, but there are some things that might be changed forever for the good. And how do we hold on to those things? Um, I want to ask, so I want to ask one question that just came in from, from the audience. How are schools assessing what has and hasn't worked with, uh, with children, with which children in order to have effective individual and group interventions? So I, Renata, you're off mute. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you all are doing that assessing? Yeah, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's what we found in the time of virtual learning that that's worked well with students in terms of interventions. Yeah, and what hasn't worked. So you kind of mentioned that, right? Like some people, yes, have learned really well virtually, but for the majority of your kids, they haven't. But what, how are you, how are you assessing that? What tools are you using? Um, and, and I don't re even mean, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know that this is what this person means, but I, it could be that the actual tools, like my son took a growth test, can't remember the acronym of it. Um, but I'm sure there are other ways in which you all are assessing that as well, in addition to like the standardized testing. So could you speak to, to both of that? Sure. So I think, of course, one starts with the, the feedback that we're getting from teachers and from parents, um, just from observing how students are responding. And that's responding not just on assessments, but responding on those day-to-day -day, uh, activities that students are doing in terms of class. I think for us, what we found is we have looked for every possible way to provide additional resources in terms of support for families. And so I think that that's also helped as well. For example, we've had a homework hotline for a period of time so that families are able to call into the homework hotline. Um, but that the hotline generally was in the afternoons. Now we've opened up so that we have some form of interaction all day where families can call in and they can get additional support. When we suspended face-to-face -face instruction, um, we opened uh, family and technology resource hubs. And as a part of those resource hubs, we had academic support at those hubs as well. So even if families were not um, getting support online, they were able to go to one of those hubs and they could meet with the, an actual person and get academic support. We've also continued to work with our academic interventionists, um, our paraeducators. We have um, partners that work with us as well that also have worked in the virtual space. So they work in terms of breakout rooms with students. They're doing small groups with students as well. And as we're transitioning back to face-to-face, -to -face, those individuals still have to follow the same safety precautions that our teachers followed. Everyone that comes to our building has to have a negative COVID test, um, but they're able to come into the building and then work with students as well. We're also, and this is another thing that I think that, that we've learned through the process, is we're also looking at how we're expanding services um, for moving forward. So additional services after school, additional services for the summer, and what those things look like, not just staying in the space of remediation. Last year, we expanded during summer programming where we didn't just do remediation or course or grade recovery, but we did enrichment, we did acceleration. Um, and so this year we're looking at the same and adding uh, to that additional um, things that you would see like in camp so that, so that you would see more of the physical activity that students also have not received. We recently, and I heard Erin reference this, and on the last call, we talked a lot about what we're doing as a district in terms of mental health support, but we recently um, put out an RFP as well so that we could expand um, our counseling services across the district and, and starting as early as the summer. So looking at those interventions as well for students and for teachers uh, as uh, across the board. So those are some of the things that we've learned and from the data that we're doing, we're finding that it's not just one data set that you're looking at um, because for us, we've also really had to take a hard look at student attendance and how students are interacting and engaging in class and what 
you know, what they're not doing. And so we across the district, we've done more around canvassing and visiting homes um, and problem solving once we get there. So we can we, we see even expanding more of that as well in terms of data. Sorry, thank you, Irina. I, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Is there, Erin, is there anything that you'd like to add as we wrap up? Um, I don't think that I would add anything to that question other than, um, you know, just continue, because I, I love that Ironetta referenced all the different data points that are being used. We're using the same ones. And I think the only thing I would add is that we still have continued to have kids do like their end of unit assessments and um, things that we always do like NWEA, just so we have a gauge. It's not, we understand it's, it's, perhaps not as reliable as it always has been, but at least it gives us an idea of whether or not kids are growing or not growing in an online platform. And so that is a piece that we can use to move forward. So a lot of data analysis is, is driving and will be driving the decisions that we make moving forward. That's actually what my sons took. You just, and, and I did, and I walked away so that I didn't help them because as a parent, it is very hard. I just had this conversation this morning. My, I checked my son's checklist and I was like, you did not, you made a mistake here, but I, you're submitting this and the teacher is going to have to correct you. And it took every bone in my body to say that and not like, you know, so, um, so it's that, that was the test, but you do have to remind parents, like, don't get involved. We do. Um, it's very hard. Hard for them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to thank you both. I, I'd also like, um, we wanted to get to kindergarten roundup. I, I want to, I, I, because we know in looking at the data where we have the, the, the largest um, decline in enrollment was around kindergarten. And as a parent, that makes a lot of logical sense to me because um, I have small children. I have a first five and a first grader. So, um, and uh, so, but, but I, I think uh, I'd like to invite you both back next week or the week after to really talk about what happens next year to ensure that our, our kindergartners are are um, getting the information, our parents of kindergartners are getting the information that they need so that they're comfortable in, in enrolling their students next year. Um, and uh, so, but I appreciate both of you. This was such great information and also just a really good reflection. It almost seems unbelievable that it's been a year and um, that we've done this for a year. So I appreciate you both and all the hard work that you do every day for kids. And I'm gonna kick it back to Terry, who's gonna introduce our next guest. Thank you both so much. Hey, Miss Ironetta. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> Always good when we see our, edu our, our educator friends uh, continuing to show up and, and to be present. Um, and excited right now uh, to bring back to the stage uh, Ms. Jesse Urban Guzman um, with our partners over at Chaz Clinic. Um, she is um, leads the work that's happening at Levita. And today, like uh, we started out um, talking about the the trauma, the stress that is happening to us right now, our ability to cope with that stress. And Jesse's going to provide with us, uh, provide for us some tips and strategies around coping with that stress, but also talking about the physical uh, versus mental health um, aspects of stress and the risk reduction when we do meet people um, who socially want to improve their mental health right now. So excited to have her back on um, and happy to hand off the microphone. How are you doing, Jesse? Good, thank you so much, Terry, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanna say that I really appreciate this opportunity to come and talk to everyone today about mental health, but also a little bit about physical versus mental health. My sense lately is that we're getting into this in-between time. Some people are getting vaccinated, case numbers are going down, then they're going up. We don't know what to do anymore. We don't know how we should act. We don't know how we should um, reach out to our friends and family, how we can support each other in a safe way. And for a long time with the pandemic, as soon as it came out, it was like, let's just stop doing everything right now. We cannot see people. 
we're a year into that and people are social creatures and it's a struggle. And so what we really wanna make sure that we're doing is talking about ways that it's not just physical health, it's not just mental health. It's really about making sure that we're healthy in all aspects of our life as best as we can right now. We've really been struggling, it's been a year and I do wanna take a moment and pause and discuss the grief that we've been through. Um, and I wanna think about a way that we can kind of get back to a place where we feel a little bit more like ourselves, where we feel like this is something that we can do for a little bit longer. Um, because I know that within this past couple of weeks, a lot of us have hit this pandemic wall where we've just felt like this feels like it's never gonna end. What do we do? It's a sense of hopelessness. And so how do we get control back? How do we re-engage in a way that that is safer because nothing is 100% safe anymore and wasn't really before the pandemic either? Um, how do we make those choices? So I wanna talk to everyone today about a, a framework for thinking about risk, for thinking about benefits, for thinking about what we need um, and what our families and what our children need. So when we think about the virus and we think about how it spreads, the main concern is inside poorly ventilated areas, people close together, right? So now that the weather's turning, there's a lot of really good opportunities to get outside, to wear a mask, to see friends, but to do it in a safe way where you're in a small group. You're not necessarily crowded around the dinner table um, having a dinner, but you're outside having a barbecue. So thinking about ways that you can make it safer to see people really helps, I think, to improve everyone's mental health. Um, we are social creatures and it's not sustainable to just stay at home for, for a year without kind of trying to think about ways that we can work with people in a safer way. So I do think it's really important that we take a step back, we think about our personal risk and we think about the risks of people around us. Now, when we think about our health um, and we try to get some control back in the pandemic, one of the things that we can think about um, and one of the benefits that I think when we think about physical versus mental health is really doing what we can to slow the pandemic, to slow the spread. So we wanna wear our masks. I definitely think that getting vaccinated when it's our turn is one of the greatest things that we can do to help the community and to help our mental health. Because what we're really doing is we're saying, I care about you, I protect myself, I protect my family, I protect the community around us. Because while vaccination is a personal health decision, it also has impacts on, on the community around us and the people around us and our ability to get back to where we were before, or at least a place that feels safer and, and like we can kind of, we can grow and continue to grow during that time. So I would also encourage vaccination as another blend between physical and mental health. Um, exercise is really important, like we've talked about. I really appreciated Kimberly's uh, yoga practice because I think it's really key to link breath and movement together. Um, and that's a really good way to reduce anxiety and again, to get a little bit of control back because right now we all feel like we're out of control. We all feel like we don't know where we're going. We don't know what to do. This isn't a situation that everybody's been through before. Um, so we're all kind of just doing our best. So another good technique that I use sometimes with our, with our kids um, and also with myself to link breath and movement is to take out your hand and take out your index finger. And all I do is I breathe in as I'm going up my pinky and breathe out as I'm going down my pinky. Breathe in as I'm going up my ring finger and breathe out as I'm going down my ring finger. Breathe in as I'm going up my middle finger and out as I'm going down my middle finger. Breathe in as I'm going up my index finger and breathe out as I'm going down. And then breathe in as I'm going up my thumb and breathe out. So it's something that you can do subtly. So if you're with around, you know, in a meeting, not like a lot of us are in face-to-face -face meetings anymore, but it's something that you can do um, so that that way you can kind of help calm your body down, calm your kids' bodies down, help help everyone kind of get to a place of peace. Because again, we're this in-between time is strange and we don't have all the answers and we don't know. And the best that we can do is kind of think about the different situations that we're getting into, think about the risk factors for our family, think about ways that we can reduce the risk. Can we distance? Can we wear masks? Can we see people outside? Um, and those things will allow us to kind of slowly start to work on getting back to where a place where, and I, I struggle with the term a new normal because again, this isn't something that feels great, 
the situation we've been in for the last year doesn't feel comfortable, it doesn't feel great. Um, I hope that some of the things from before we're able to kind of bring back those things that we really value about family, about closeness, about friends, about people, um, because that really is a place where we can succeed together. And I think that is an important part of coping. So I think it's not so much that we either don't see people at all or that we run inside and go to a club or see a lot of people all together in a big group, but we figure out ways that we can, you know, take certain actions that are not, that are less risky than others. Um, and it, it's, I know that we're all getting to a point in the pandemic where we're really tired of making decisions when we don't really know what the outcome is gonna be and we're having decision-making fatigue. Um, but I would just encourage everybody to take a step back and realize that in making the best decisions we can, we know that we're giving ourselves grace. We know that they're not perfect, but we also know that we're doing the best that we can right now. Um, and then that helps to give us a little bit of control and helps us a little bit with the anxiety too. We can't necessarily control the outcome, but we can make the best decision for ourselves and our families at the time. And we can encourage other people to do the same thing. Um, and then again, um, as one of the other speakers said earlier, just the importance of giving people grace, uh, giving ourselves grace, giving our families grace, giving our kids grace, giving the teachers grace. Everybody right now is struggling in their own ways. And I just, um, I think that just taking a moment, being grateful that we've made it to this point uh, and we're not done yet, but we're hopeful that things will improve, especially as we get to the summer. Um, and we're hopeful that we can just kind of take a step back and appreciate the people around us and give everyone grace and realize that we, we're all doing the best that we can. So thank you very much for your time. Ah, Jesse, that was some awesome advice and tools that you gave us. Um, while I might not be able to do the hand thing up top over the table, I can definitely do it under the table uh, <laughs> once we get back into in-person meetings. So uh, thanks for those tools. Thanks for your, your presence again and all the work that Chaz does every day. Uh, to support not just families in Southwest Detroit, but families across the city. So thank you again for everything. Thank you so much, Terry. All right, I'm I'm going to because again I'm I'm I'm, I'm double dutching. Uh, so so what do we need to do now, Christine? What do we need to do now? <laughs> uh, what a what an analogy. And I I actually agree with Jesse that saying the new normal is tough for me. It's like how do we how do we get through? Oh, we're going to, everybody gets to see Sophie's dress. <laughs> I love that you dress up your dog, Terry. Um, I've known Terry for a very long time. I never, uh, I would have never guessed that he would have dressed his dog. So I, I married, I married dog. a woman who dresses our dog. So let's, let's just get that. I'm okay with it though. Yeah. Well, Sophie is adorable. So Jesse, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think reminding all of us to give give each other grace, but also ourselves grace, is really important in this in this time that is as uncertain as it was when we started a year ago. Just because of all the things that you just described, and um, so we are gonna we are gonna close our town hall for today. We are so grateful for all the, the folks that came on today to talk with us. And we are so grateful for all of you that, um, that uh, listened with us today. Please remember that we want to hear from you. So if there's a topic or an expert that you are really interested in us bringing on, please put that in the chat right now, um, or you can text that to 313-288-2082. Again, that number is 313-288-2082. I truly show up here every week because um, I want to bring relevant information to people on the ground. It has been so helpful for me as a parent in making decisions. And, and so we really do mean we want to hear from you. We want to know what your questions are. We want to know who you want to hear from. So um, a big thank you to all of our panelists for each of you joining us today. Again, if your question wasn't answered today, 
we'll get you the answers and uh, and then post them next week on one DBS uh, one Detroit TBS org and on DP TV's Facebook. Um, this town hall is truly a group effort, so we want everybody to turn on their cameras right now. Everyone, 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 thank you so much. And we want to remind everybody like we do every week to stay healthy, stay powerful, and stay strong. Cindy, will you please say that in Spanish? Manténganse saludables, seguros, y fuertes. Thank you all so much. We will see you all next week. Thank you. Make it a great Bye. day. Yes. Bye. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>